How you doing, man? Good to see you. How's everything? Everything's going great. Beautiful. Dutch Bros. Never Are you been? in? You've never totally been. never been here. I've heard unbelievable things about it. All right, let's try it out. About this. Hey, guys, welcome in. I'm going to go regular coffee. Regular well, coffee? Yeah, I know it sounds kind of boring, but yeah. I understand. You got it. Do you trust me? For sure. For sure? Okay, I recommend our kicker. It's our classic drink. It's got Irish cream, half and half, and coffee. It's awesome. Yeah? Can you handle that? Tom Dempsey, the kicker. <laughs> you let's got go. it. <laughs> what about for you? I'm going to go uh, Dutch soda. Dutch soda? Absolutely. All right. We got this one for you. Wow, look how fast. And last but not least, I'm dying to know what you think. All right, stand back. Ooh, good. Thank you guys so much for coming in. We Thanks, appreciate you. All right, so look, look around. This is what you grew up with. <laughs> Your dad was the producer of Hee Haw, as a lot of people know. Right. You have lights and audio guys and cameras and the whole microphones and the whole thing. Right. This was really, you should be, you should be a natural here. <laughs> yeah, I spent a lot of time um, in this environment, for sure. And, you know, for a lot of the years of my life, when I was young, I didn't really know what was going on. I just was going to work with my dad, and uh, whether it was at the CBS studio in Los Angeles or then a transition out to the Grand Ole Opry in Nashville, Tennessee, I was behind the scenes and I was a little kid standing below the camera, uh, right next to the cameraman, and just enjoying the experience and watching my dad work and watching the actors act. So a, a lot of guys who were kids and grew up with baseball uh, fathers or older brothers, they run around clubhouses. Yeah. You're running around Hollywood sets in Los Angeles. Right. Just free reign, right? Yeah, I didn't, I didn't really know anything other than go to work with dad. And um, my parents raised me in a normal environment and they, they tried to probably protect me from, from that Hollywood lifestyle. Um, and I was just a, a, a valley boy from, from Encino, California. But um, I did, as I reflect on it, I did remember going and doing some spectacular things while I was with my dad. It was at the CBS studio in Los Angeles, California for the first several, several years. Um, and I, mean, I got a chance to sit in Archie Bunker's chair. And How I'd about make, that? Uh, it's uh, unbelievable. So, so I go to the Smithsonian this past um, road trip um, to Washington, D.C., and my wife and I you know, were walking around, and I get a chance to look at the chair that I sat in when I was nine years old. And it's like behind glass yeah, or, yeah, or rope or exactly, whatever. Exactly. I sat there. Yeah, it's, un it's unreal. I mean, it, you got the ruby red slippers over here next to that, and it's a piece of history. And I always remember the interesting part of that, if you can remember that set, um, Meathead would run up the stairs right. and, and he'd disappear in the middle of, of a scene. Once you get up to the top of those stairs, it was a landing, it was a platform that went right back downstairs behind the set. That was pretty interesting to me, more, more so than, than anything else, but it was Sunny and Cher's beads. If you can remember the, the closing of Sunny and Cher that I'd go crashing through the beads, <laughs> listen to them banging against one another, or the Price is Right set. Um, the Price is Right set? Yeah, the Price Come is on right. down, Come Tori on. Lovello. <laughs> that was good, I like that. <laughs> yeah, so those are things that I think about now, but when I was doing it, I was just being a kid. So where did baseball start to sneak into the picture? Or well, sports, yeah. you're a jock. You're not a baseball right? guy per se. Yeah, you, totally. you watch NFL on Sundays, yep. you love boxing, you're crazy about basketball, right. obviously the baseball. I mean, you're, you're like the LA jock. Yeah, I think I'm a full jock, no doubt, yeah. no doubt about it. Um, my dad had an unbelievable thirst for sports and it started with, with UCLA probably. I think that's where we had this common ground where it was UCLA football and then definitely UCLA basketball. And you know, as parents go, you're working hard. My dad was doing his best to make ends meet and do his job, but he would spend the weekends with us and it was all sports all the time, whether it was ping pong in the backyard or swimming, um, whatever it was, there was a lot of activity. And I think that was my parents. And um, you know, I have three older siblings that Made this made made the household very very competitive. I was you were the youngest. I was the youngest. Did yes. you get beat up? I did. I did get <laughs> beat up for sure. Who I am now is definitely what I what I learned as a child. I think that's that's um, a psychology has proven that. And I had a good infrastructure. I had a secure attachment with my parents. Um, I had a normal upbringing with with my siblings. Very competitive, and it was all about sports. And I think that kind of that pushed me in that direction. And then baseball was a branch. Baseball was definitely a branch that I was good at. And it kind of naturally went that way, but if you were to ask me when I was in 10th or 11th grade, and maybe even today, my favorite sport when I was growing up was definitely basketball. And it's a big part of what you do today. The, the, 
Basketball coaches games have been going on on the road for years now. Right. There are teams, score is kept, records are kept, there are uniforms. This is a major deal. Yeah, we, um, I just wanted to establish a culture of family and a bond. And I think that um, you know, if you talk to some of the players or the staff, they, they definitely feel that. I feel like as you, as you move around the country, and you know what that's like, you get on a plane and you live in a hotel, um, you're away from your immediate family, and that's hard. But if you can supplement that with your with your family that you're working with, that helps ease it. And then it also helps you function as a group and establish a culture that I'm trying to create here. That is, we are brothers. When I got first got the job, I heard that there was this min, like this small basketball game that was going on between Mike Fetters and Nate Shaw and Ken Crenshaw and Ryan DePanfilo every once in a while, maybe once or twice a year. And I thought, let's just blow the roof off of this and let's just, let's go out and play. And, and it's open to anybody, um, including Cindy, by the way. She's including dying Cindy. to play. She yep. played at Washington State. She's working on her to jump shot right now. And she's going to play on the white team. That we, we have that's a, your team. That's my team, the Sedona Red team and the white team. We have the re reversible jerseys. And we take it very serious, trust me. Oh, I know, yeah. But I know that Cindy's got the sweet jumper. We need, we need an outside <laughs> shooter on the white team. We bang down low. We bang pretty hard. But... Um, we need somebody on the outside that can drop drop that 25 footer. But um, we start. It just it just evolved, and it, it became a part of what we do on every road trip in every city. And it's to the point now where we go to the same venues. We're lucky. We're very very lucky that we can get out there and we can run around on the court. Um, and we have an MVP that we get out into the center of the circle. We take a picture around them. And at the end of the year, I get a little um, a little flip book with all the photos. So. Whoever played gets the book, and they have a good memory of the year, and it, it seems to be make the guys really happy. That's a really well. neat thing. It's interesting now, because we're about the same age. I've talked to you about when you were a player coming up, because you really, you were, in, you were a grinder. Mm -hmm. A lot of time in the minors, bits and pieces in the majors, up, down, up, down, up, down all the time. But you've told me that as a player, you were a real spoiled pain in the neck. That, that, that's the way you've described yourself, at least that's my impression. Were you, am I wrong on that? What were you like as a player? I think I was more stubborn than anything. Um, people tried to help me make adjustments and I, I was very resistant to that. Maybe because I felt like I was a little bit misunderstood. But once I got into the later points of my career, I, I had to undo that. I had to unravel that the best that I could. Well, that's just basic human maturity. I think it is, totally. Yeah. I, you know, when I was 27 years old, I was a different player than I was when I was 23. You know, I came out of college, I was drafted, I got to the big leagues in a hurry. I thought The next I, year? Yeah, I mean, one year after college, I was in the major leagues, which was an unbelievable dream. thought I had it made. I think that entitlement or that, that spoiled thought would enter my mind more than anything at that point in time. Then I became very resistant because a lot of people were telling me what to do and I wasn't listening because I thought I knew everything. But once you realize you don't know everything and as one of my favorite coaches said, it's what you learn after you think you know everything that you become who you're supposed to be. Have you seen players that you have now that remind you of young Tori Lovello? Yeah, of course. There's some players that remind me of myself. Um, we, and, and not by the way of being, entitled or spoiled mm -hmm. or stubborn. No names. But by the way they um, perform on the field, I probably played a little bit like Ildemaro Vargas. You know, he's got a firecracker in his pants and he just plays with a ton of energy and a huge belief that he's gonna go out there and be a really good player. I was a middle infielder, he's a middle infielder. I was a switch hitter, he's a switch hitter. Um, you know, just had an incredible passion for the game, has an incredible passion for the game. I was the same way, so I, I enjoy him. I watch him play and think, now that's, that's somebody that I admire for the, not the obvious reasons, because he's a very good player, but because I align with him very well. And you have similar stories. He was coming up through the Cardinal system, he played independent ball, he played in the minor leagues, he's been up and down, up and down, a lot like you were. Yeah. You, 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 in that way, I think you have very similar paths. Well, I, I naturally migrate to those guys, for sure, that they, um, they have not been given everything right away. And there are those players that deserve that, and they get to the big leagues very quickly. 
Uh, Ildemaro is somebody that has had to grind his way through two organizations and I know what that means and I know what that takes to, to persevere. And perseverance in, in professional sports is a, is a huge concept. So when you can get through those moments and have uh, um, the shining light on the other side and you can tell a good story, I, I really enjoy those types of players. Grinding your way through organizations, you played for, what, seven, seven teams in eight years? You know why? I just told everybody I was so popular and such a great guy that everybody wanted me on their team. But that had to be hard. It was actually because I stunk and I couldn't stick with one team, <laughs> right? Oh, no. I was usually the 24th. Somebody 20th. else wanted you every time. See what I'm saying? Yeah. That's what I mean. They, could, they couldn't wait to get this guy on their team. I was usually the 23rd, 24th, 25th, 26th, 27th guy on the team. That, that range of player falls off of rosters gets picked up on waivers, gets traded, gets moved around a lot. How hard is that? That's basically your existence for most of your professional career. That yeah. had to be difficult at times. Yeah, so it was a grinding career. So I had four, four um, years of service time. So if you add up the service days and you mm -hmm. walk through it, so I had four years and I spent, what, 12, 13 years in, in professional baseball. So as you add that up, it's eight or nine years in the minor leagues versus four years at the major league level. Um, I had to earn it. I had to go out there and, and prove and earn, and I'm very proud of that. And I was in an era where the steroids were popping up and um, the players were excelling and running right by me, and I had to work extremely hard to keep up with those great players, and I'm proud of that. I'm very, very proud of that. I'm proud of the fact that I did what I did for as long as I did because it built me into what I am right now. And I understand what players go through, and I feel like it helps me be a better leader. Do you remember the day where you were, where it hit you like, I'm not a player anymore? I totally do. Um, like that's it, it's over? It was in spring training. I retired after the 2000 season, so it was the 2001 season. I was gonna go as a guest instructor uh, to Winter Haven, Florida, with the Cleveland Indians in minor league camp and just learn. I wanted to transition into being a manager. I was like, all right, I gotta get out there for stretch. And I looked at the window and I saw all these, looked through the window, I saw all these players gathering up and getting in line and I'm like, I don't need to do that. I don't ever need to do that again. Like, you gotta transition your thoughts. Like, you're a staff member, you're gonna be walking out there and they're gonna be looking at you a little differently. Your name is not on the player list. Wake up and start wow. to become the best staff member you can. That was with Cleveland? That was with the Cleveland Indians, yeah. And eventually there, you ran into an intern named Mike Hazen at some point, right? I did, I sure did. You remember so, that? Of course I do. Of course I do. He used to do, when I, would, I ended up becoming a field manager the next year in 2002, is I would um, call in the game reports and I'd speak really fast and he was the one that was listening to the game reports on the other end and scribbling everything down and then he would put it in a document and send it to the front office so they could read it. And I knew that that guy was listening and I knew that it was a guy by the name of Mike Hazen and I didn't know that he would turn into the general manager of the Arizona <laughs> okay, Diamondbacks one day. Is that wild? It is crazy. You spent a lot of time managing in the minors, just like as a player. As you developed that second part of your baseball career, it came a lot like your playing career. Bus rides, minor league ballparks, long hours, reports to the yeah. front office. What was that like coming up as a minor league manager? You really paid your dues in that regard as well. Yeah, well, once again, it helped me, helped me get to where I'm at and understand who I am a little bit more. Um, each year I was in the minor leagues, it was defining exactly what what I would become. And I, I value the, the 10 years that I spent in the minor leagues. I, I, I wouldn't change it for the world. I wouldn't trade one bus ride. I wouldn't trade one tough conversation. I wouldn't trade one day of throwing BP in 110 degree heat in, in Columbus, Georgia for, for anything. I love what I did. I love the roots that I established as a staff member to help me turn into what I am today. And you spent a lot of time in Buffalo where you met a, a lovely young lady. Yeah. That's worked out pretty well. You're yeah, a lucky man. Life kind of drops things in on you when you least expect it. And, um, you know, I, don't, I wasn't looking for a relationship. I wasn't, I wasn't looking for a wife. I just was being me and just walking through the minor leagues as a, as a staff member. And um, somebody caught my eye, that's for sure. <laughs> I saw her walking by one day and I'm like, who's that? And um, I caught the word and found out she was single. And I chased her around for about five or six months. And six she, months? Yeah, she was giving me the Heisman. Yeah. What so, was the problem? She didn't I, I run don't away know. your natural charm, your communication skills, the connecting with people. We talked about all this. Yes. 
How can you turn away from this guy? I can't. Right? <laughs> How, How did, did she? Go? What was the issue? So she was uh, working in the front office in Buffalo for oh, the Buffalo okay. Bisons, and her boss put the fear of God in her that there was no crossover, you couldn't date anybody that was coming from the Cleveland Indian organization. And I guess I fell under that window, and she yeah. was she was really, um, you know, she was going to follow that rule. Her job was very important to her. She just made up her mind that the answer was no. In fact, one day, I, I, um, I asked her, you know, hey, is, is there a chance you would go out with me? And she stonewalled me and said, nope, that's it. Leave me alone. Wow. And I did. I honored that. And then, and then maybe about two weeks later, she sent me a text and she said, what's, what's a girl got to do to have somebody ask, ask her out on a date? Mixed messages, hello. Right? Yes. I think that two, in that two week period of time, she may have gotten a better, a better feel from her boss that was gonna allow it. And I, I mean, I can't blame her. She was following the rules and she, her, her job was important to her, but I think in that two week transition where things started to turn in my favor, you know, <laughs> I think the, her boss maybe got involved a little bit and eventually, like I said, brought me to her for grace. That's great, that's a cool story. Yeah. The wives and the families are part, even on, on my limited end, a big part of, of getting us through the season. Yeah. How does this job and all the responsibilities, things like this, the, re, uh, the requirements of your time, how does she deal with all of that? It's hard on her. Um, she she just wants me to be around, as any wife does, and and um, it, it's hard on families. It really is. I, I get to the ballpark early. I stay late. We go on the road. Um, so I feel like it's my job when I'm at home to engage and give as much time as I possibly can to, to her and the children. And it, trust me, sometimes it's hard. I, I don't try not to carry the game home, but um, it's, it's a little bit of a challenge from time to time. But when we get the balance and the separation, um, I know that, that she really, really appreciates that. She's a pistol. She's high energy. There's, yeah. there's got to be <laughs> nights where you get home and the bullpen has had a blow up. And I'm sure you don't want to talk to anybody right. against Kristen, but that's yeah. got to be a little cool down period for the yeah. husband at that point. She's the best. She's the best. She gets my signal. She gets my bat signal every once in a while. When I come home, she knows me. I think she gets, she can tell by looking at me that if I want to have a conversation, there's times where I'll tell her, look, not tonight. I need, I need to step away. I'd rather just go and watch TV or let's play some cards or do something and, and help take my mind off of the game. But um, yeah, she wants to talk. She, she's ready to chit chat. She's ready to go. <laughs> sometimes she wants to talk about the game, and sometimes she's a fan. She'll look at me and tell me that was the stupidest thing you've ever done. No. Why, why did you do that? Or what were you thinking? Cup of Coffee is presented by Dutch Bros, the fun loving coffee company making a massive difference one cup at a time. So when Mike Hazen got hired with the Diamondbacks, what did that mean for you, right? When you heard, did Mike call you and say, I got the job, let's talk? How did that work? Well, he didn't tell me, believe it or not. He yeah, wasn't, well, that's, he wasn't very, that's the most Mike Hazen thing yeah, ever, right? isn't it? I know, it is. He talked about humble, private, and proud. I mean, that, that's part of his personality and what makes him so special. I mean, he does, if you, if you try and give Mike Hazen a compliment, he's like, shut up, dude, don't it, say that to me again. It makes him uncomfortable. It makes him very uncomfortable. Yeah. But that's who he is and we know it. And that's why, that's why we love him. The president um, of the Red Sox had sent me a text and he said, you know, I'm really happy for Mike. It's gonna be a really good opportunity for him to, you know, get that Diamondback organization pushed in the right direction and help lead him towards a world championship. End of the text. And I'm like, wait, what? What? What is that? So what do I do? I naturally, boom, I get the phone and I call Mike and I'm like, bro, what happened here? Like, fill in this gap. Is something happening that I don't need, that I need to know about? Like, are you leaving? He's like, yeah, um, last night I was named um, the, the uh, general man manager of the Arizona Diamondbacks. He goes, I gotta go. <laughs> Man, that Thanks, mess, I gotta go. Maybe I'll be in touch with you. Talk to you later. Whoa! That was the end of it. That was the end of it right there. It was about a three-minute conversation. So did you think like, okay, I guess I'll just be staying here? I, I didn't know anything really, but obviously I was speculating like, I wonder if he's gonna call because of our connection and our baseball bond. Um, I was wondering, and, and uh, I, I'll never forget, my wife and I were vacationing out in Ojai up in Santa Barbara County. And I got a phone call, it was Dave Dombrowski, who's the president of the Boston Red Sox, and he just said, 
I need to let you know that the Arizona Diamondbacks and Mike Hazen have asked for permission. I'm going to grant them permission to talk to you, to interview you, to become their, their big league manager. So Mike was very professional about this, went through all the yes. proper channels. It wasn't, hey, buddy, I'll call you in two days and make you the manager. You really had to no. go through the process, didn't you? Right. For those of us that know Mike, he follows he follows the, the letter of the law, and he does not break rules. And I lo that's very honorable. I love that. I don't like rule breakers either. And sure enough, at, you know, two minutes after Dave had called me, Mike called me and said, we're going to get you in on this date. And it was a very formal interview. I, I was in front of the panel. It wow. was extremely formal. That was what I was going to ask you. Like, how do you have that interview and that conversation with a guy that you know so well and have yeah. known that way for a long time? How do you go from friendship to formal? Well, we, like I said, we have that balance. We have that ability to switch back and forth. Um, and I knew walking in there that I was going to have to be at my absolute best. And I, I think I might have only told my wife this. She said, are you nervous? And I said, I am more nervous for this interview than any other. Why? Because I didn't want to let Mike down. He looked at me, the first thing he said to me, and this is one of his great gifts. Right. He looked at me and he said, dude, what's the matter with you? Will you relax? <laughs> you can just tell by looking at me that I was very uptight. Well, and it's a I, pretty big job interview. Well, that's what I told him. I said, look, man, I'm, what do you think I'm nervous for? Like, I'm going in, I'm going in to win this, right? Is what I was thinking. I didn't say, any, say anything. But there, it was deeper than that because I didn't want to let him down. Sure. I, wanted, I wanted to do what friends do for one another. I wanted to make him proud. Has it gone the way you thought it would? Probably better than, than I had ever imagined. Uh, had ever imagined. Um, he is um, an incredible boss. He tells it like it is. There's, there's no waste of time. Um, there's an angle at everything. There's a strategy with everything. And it's exactly what I've always thought a general manager manager relationship would be like. It's, I know our wives are going to laugh at this, but it's like being married, right? I'm, mm -hmm. I'm married to Mike Hazen. And that's, you have good days, you have bad days. You have, you have great moments, you have arguments. Um, but at the end of the day, you turn the page for the better cause. And the better cause for, for us is these players and doing what's right for these players and driving towards a world championship one day. Well, the next show will be with Nicole and we'll get her version <laughs> of that, right? Right, I mean, our wives could probably tell you a totally different story, <laughs> but it might be along the lines of us being, uh, being married. Thanks for doing this. My pleasure. Appreciate it. Thanks, Bert. Yeah, enjoy it. When you first came up with the Tigers, late 80s, and then some of the other teams, when you were a young player who knew it all and had all the answers, yeah. did you ever butt heads with one of the veterans that really did have all the answers? I did, I did, and I think you might be talking about no, a story. I'm not, no, I'm not talking yeah. about anything specific. You don't have to <laughs> yeah. name any names. These are That's those, your call. These are those fun times that you know, yes. those intimate stories. Yes. In my office. Yeah, you know, um, I in, in my generation, um, it was mostly about, um, I'm not going to say bullying, um, but it was the veterans that could push through and, and, and say whatever they wanted to to a rookie young player. And um, it just, it wasn't a very healthy environment. You know, the younger players were picked on to toughen them up and they were um, giving them tough love to help them grow up the right way. And there was, a, there was a huge pecking order and there still is a pecking order. You know, the guys that have spent 10 years in the big leagues, that's hard to do. There's not a lot of players that have done that and you can't force your, your service time. So the younger players, I think, you know, they have to gravitate to become that veteran leader mentality. Mm -hmm. But trust me, there are some one year players that have great, a great leadership quality. And I try to get into those guys as well. But yeah, there was one particular veteran that was very hard on me in Detroit. I'm not gonna use his name because he, he's a spectacular human being today and, and we've resolved it. He walked through it and said, hey man, that was my bad, I'm sorry, I was tough on you. And it just made my life really, really uncomfortable. And you know, you walk in the clubhouse doors and, um, and you're wondering like, where, where's that voice coming from? It's gonna come from somewhere. And some days it was okay and, and other days it was, it was excruciating. What that taught me today though is there are no levels in our organization. There is no, the one year player has a voice in our clubhouse. And if I hear something like that, I stop it right away. I don't appreciate that, I don't like that. I don't like the idea of somebody picking on somebody to help them grow up any quicker. This game's hard enough. It'll help you, it'll help you grow up at the right pace and you'll get there. 
but we don't have any separation. Our 10-year guys treat the one-year guys with nothing but respect. And I didn't want that to be specific to you because every player who came up in your era had a, has the same story. Totally. And that guy who just tortured him in the clubhouse. The totally. Veteran. Totally, It's yeah. amazing how that culture has changed. It's a definite changeover, and um, I'm, I'm proud of the fact that we do that here in Arizona. And, uh, you know, there's no more rookie dress-up stuff. We do a theme dress-up on a lot of road trips. So, yeah, we, we've, changed, we've changed the culture um, in this game for the better, and, and, and I like what we do here in Arizona. John Farrell gets sick in Boston. Yeah. And you take over. And, and that seems to be the point where everything changed for you. Like you got on everybody's radar. Wow, that Lavello guy in Boston has done a heck of a job. That, yeah. What was that experience like for you? Yeah, first of all. It was Very a, difficult circumstances. Yeah, I, I need to say that because John was one of my closest friends um, and I was his bench coach. And, you know, he calls me and tells me he's got cancer. Um, I about, you know, fell, fell to the floor and I'm like, you know, how does this happen? And you realize that cancer cancer touches a lot of lives, and it impacted me directly, and it hurt. You know, the guys really rallied around one another, and we played good baseball, and, yeah. and we got back into the race, and and because it had not been a good season up to that. Point. Yeah, it was a, it was a challenging season. We yeah. were several games under 500. I think we were chasing 500. We fell a little bit short, a couple games short, but we had a good team that just never really caught a tailwind, and. I think everybody rallied around John's illness to, to play their best baseball. And it gave me a chance to, to cut my teeth, to cut my big league teeth. I'd done it a lot in the minor leagues. I, I, don't, I, can't, I don't even know how many games in the minor leagues, but it was 10 years of managing in the minor leagues. And it just got me back on that managing clock. And I started to get a feel for the game. And I enjoyed it. And I felt like that was what I always wanted to do. And I, I gave me the confidence that I could do it. And all this is taking place in Boston. Mm -hmm. It's the Red Sox. There's mm -hmm. a tremendous amount of media and interest and importance placed on that. And, and you're doing it, I think, not only under those difficult circumstances, but in that place where it becomes an even bigger deal than it would be in other places. Yeah, you know Boston, right? You know the Boston born market. Raised. I never know you're there. Uh, born and raised there, yeah. So it's very unique. You can't describe it until you've been there. And it comes from a place of passion. Those fans are unbelievable and everything you do, everything you say is scrutinized. That was a little overwhelming, but like I said, when, to be. when John told me he had cancer, I found, I found strength for him to, to go out there and, and with courage. Like he, he was fighting every single day for his life that I was, gonna, I was gonna do the best that I could to stand up and, and be a good leader for him. Did you find after that point the team started calling and saying, hey, we wanna talk to you about a manager job? Yeah. It did happen. I know a lot of people were interested, um, but I committed to John to stay there until he was healthy. And he was going to have a very rugged off season. And because of that, after the 15th season, I felt like it was my obligation to go back in 16 until he was back in the dugout. And I told him that the first day that he told me he had cancer, I was going to be there for him until he was back in the dugout. And I wanted to honor that commitment and spent 16 with the Boston Red Sox again. That's pretty impressive. Well, it, I, you know what? I, I think it's what good friends would do for one another. John was my friend before he was my boss. Um, and I was going to lay down for him and do all that I could. First time I was ever around you, I. I would watch you have conversations with people, and it's striking, especially these days, you look the other person in the eye, you listen to what they said, and you ask them questions about themselves, which is, I think, very uncommon, not just in sports, but in our culture these days. Did you have to practice that? Does that come natural to you? Are you naturally interested in other people? Well, for sure. I, I, I really have um, an active interest in, in getting to know people and having conversation with people and then giving, giving them the attention that they've probably given me. And I feel like it, that's how you develop good relationships, build trust, and that's the foundation of what we are in, at Arizona. You see me a little bit more raw than most people. I know that we spend a lot of time together pregame. You see me through the frustrating times, you hear some of the good stories, you hear some of the funny stories, you see it all. But I think my common denominator is engaging, talking to, and learning about the person that I'm, I'm sitting with. 
because in a baseball player's world, I need to make decisions on them to put them in the best situation possible. So I have to get to know them on, on the deepest level so I can help make decisions, whether it's not whether or not it's putting them in a game or maybe some, uh, something that's gonna happen in the off season about their career. I wanna get to know somebody and communication for me is a two way street. It's also, it's, it's about me telling you what's on my mind, expressing myself properly, but it's also being an active listener. I was gonna say, do you, to get a player to where you want them to be as a baseball player, do you have to figure out the person first? Yeah, for me, that's, that's, that's um, base camp number one. I need to get to know their heart. I got to get to know their head and I dig in there as, as best that I can and it's not it's not a motive it's not anything that, that I have I have to cover my agenda to get there it's very generic and um, I just go in and spend time with somebody and I, I start to ask questions about their life and their family and I think they start to figure out really quick that I care because I think there's some authenticity in that because I'm genuinely interested I really enjoy lis listening to people getting to know people getting to know their signals, their heart, uh, their minds, because that's who I am. That's where I am at my core.